Mount Shasta is a potentially active volcano residing in the southern portion of the Cascade Range in Northern California. Mount Shasta has always been the focus of an unusually high number of myths and legends, many of which are paranormal in nature. According to local indigenous tribes, namely the Klamath people, a spirit chief named Skel descended from the heavens and now inhabits the mountain. More recently, many non-native legends have formed around Mount Shasta as well. For instance, many of those that live near and around Mount Shasta today will tell you that a race of advanced beings inhabit the mountain. These beings are said to be survivors of the lost continent of Lemuria. Apparently, these beings inhabit a web of complex tunnels beneath the mountain and are occasionally said to be spotted walking the surface of Mount Shasta in white robes. Many supernatural abilities are ascribed to these entities, and people have even reported that these entities have built a large, advanced city on top of the mountain that can only be seen in certain conditions. The area around the mountain sees unusually frequent reports of UFO sightings, characterized by mysterious lights dancing among the clouds. The region is generally known as an area of high strangeness in which supernatural phenomena of all types are likely to occur. Mount Shasta also sees frequent unexplained disappearances, perhaps more than one would expect even for a remote wilderness region. Those that explore the area also often report the feeling of being watched all throughout the woods on and around the mountain. In this video, we'll take a close look at some of the aforementioned disappearances, as well as some of the legends and strange history surrounding Mount Shasta. Here's the first story. On October 1st, 2010, a three-year-old boy and his family were camping around Mount Shasta. According to the boy's father, at around 6 p.m., he suddenly realized he couldn't find his son anywhere. He said his son was literally there one second and gone the next after he briefly looked away. In a panic, the boy's family scoured the surrounding area, but they couldn't find him anywhere. You'd think that they would have found him quickly since he went missing so fast, as there wasn't enough time for the boy to get very far on his own. After hours of unsuccessful searching, the family contacted local police and the U.S. Forest Service to report him missing. Rescue personnel scoured the forest well into the night, but there was no sign of the missing boy. Then, after five hours of searching, the boy was finally found. He was in the brush directly adjacent to a trail that had previously been searched repeatedly. He was found in a dazed, semi-conscious state, which the boy's family assumed was simply a result of exhaustion. They were just grateful he was found physically unharmed. When the boy's parents asked him what happened while he was missing, he shared a fascinating and disturbing tale. The boy said that while he was lost in the woods, he was taken deep inside an underground cave by a woman who looked exactly like his grandma, who he always called Cappy. Since she looked identical to his grandma Cappy, naturally, the boy assumed that it was his grandma. The boy said that the cool, dark cave was filled with motionless humanoid robots, with dusty purses and guns scattered along the cave floor. As the boy looked at who he thought was his grandma Cappy, he noticed a strange glow radiating from her head. In this moment, he suddenly realized that she wasn't really his grandma, and he assumed that she was actually a robot. The boy said that this robot version of his grandmother then asked him to defecate on a piece of sticky paper. When he refused, she became increasingly agitated and repeated the request numerous times, but again, the boy refused. The entity then apparently told the boy that he was from outer space and was implanted into his mother's womb. Shortly thereafter, the robot entity led the boy back outside and into a thicket and advised him to wait there to be found. The boy's family was obviously shocked to hear such a bizarre story, but they didn't necessarily believe him. However, when the boy later relayed the exact same story to his real grandma, Cappy, they took it more seriously. After hearing the boy's account of what happened in the woods, his grandma shared a bizarre story of her own. One year earlier, Grandma Cappy had gone camping with a friend at Mount Shasta, very nearby the location from which the boy disappeared. As she was preparing to go to sleep in those woods, she shined her flashlight into the tree line and noticed several pairs of glowing red eyes staring back at her. She was creeped out but just assumed that it was a herd of deer. However, she awoke the next morning face down in the dirt. Somehow she left her sleeping bag and tent overnight. After waking up, she noticed an intense pain at the base of her neck, and her friend felt the same thing. They both had inflamed, red puncture marks in that spot on their necks. They became violently ill, and assumed the whole thing was the result of spider bites. Eventually, they packed up and headed home, but Grandma Cappy said it took months for her to feel right again after this incident. After hearing her grandson's bizarre tale, she couldn't help but suspect the two incidents were related in some way. 
Considering that these two incidents occurred at pretty much the exact same location around Mount Shasta, I can definitely see why the boy's grandmother feels that they're connected. Explaining exactly what that connection is, though, is easier said than done, and I'm open to numerous possibilities at this point. I'm almost tempted to suggest that the wound on the grandmother's neck was some sort of needle mark after a DNA extraction. Also, it would be easy to flat out disregard the missing boy's testimony considering how young he is, as young kids do sometimes say really bizarre stuff, but the family has said that he's repeated this story numerous times without changing any details. Plus, if the boy simply wandered off on his own and that's all that caused this disappearance, I suspect the search teams would have found him right away. For these reasons and more, the boy's story could actually be credible. The next case we'll cover is the disappearance of 69-year-old Carl Landers. On May 25, 1999, Carl and two of his friends were attempting to summit Mount Shasta. Carl had already summited 57 of the highest mountain peaks in the state, as he had the goal of summiting the highest peak in each county of California. Mount Shasta would have been his last summit before completing that goal. So, Carl was obviously in excellent shape, so there was no cause for concern when he and his two friends, Barry Gilmore, 60, and Milton Gaines, 64, left for this trip. Plus, the route they were taking up the mountain is very popular and is considered quite safe. On the night of the 24th, a day before Carl disappeared, the group camped out at an area known as 5050 Plateau, just short of Lake Helen, and they planned to make their final push for the summit in the morning. Carl was apparently experiencing some altitude sickness at this point, and his friends noted that he left camp numerous times that night to relieve himself. Carl still felt somewhat sick once morning rolled around, so he decided to get a head start towards Lake Helen by himself in order to avoid slowing down the whole group. The lake is only a short distance from 5050 Plateau, and the route is very direct. Carl's friend Barry started feeling ill on this morning as well, so Milton headed to Lake Helen alone to meet up with Carl. Strangely, when Milton arrived at the lake, Carl wasn't there, so he headed back to their camp at 5050 Plateau. After the short walk back to camp, Milton discovered that Carl wasn't there either, which was extremely concerning, so he notified the authorities that Carl was missing. A man named Grizz Adams was in charge of the search for Carl. After exhaustive searches all over Mount Shasta, not a single clue pointing to Carl's fate was found. Grizz Adams was quoted as saying, In 35 years, I've never had this happen to me. We were all over that mountain. He was not on the mountain. We brought canines in and they didn't pick him up. We flew around it. We dropped guys at the summit and they came down all sides. They couldn't find him. There's snow around the path where he was and nobody went outside that path. When asked what happened, Grizz replied, that's the million dollar question. He either went up or in, but he's not on it. County Sheriff spokeswoman Susan Gravenkamp said the following, We've just looked everywhere that we can look, and we just don't know where else to look. Apparently, Carl's footsteps were observed in the snow heading up towards Lake Helen, but they eventually stopped altogether as if Carl was plucked off the mountain by some unseen entity. To this day, no trace of Carl or his gear has ever been found. What makes this situation even stranger is that there are no dense forests or obvious crevices that could conceivably hide a body in the area between 5050 Plateau and Lake Helen. Plus, when search dogs scoured the area, they couldn't find any trace of Carl's scent whatsoever. Furthermore, in 1904, British prospector J.C. Brown was hired by the Lord Carvery Mining Company of England to scour the Mount Shasta region for gold prospects. Apparently, Brown made a bizarre discovery during this time. Brown said that, during his scouting of the wilderness in the area, he did some digging beneath a cliff because he thought something looked like it had been buried there. After digging for some time, he unearthed a strange tunnel that was ten feet high by seven feet wide. The tunnel curved downward into the earth, so Brown made the descent to see where it led. The tunnel led to several underground chambers filled with amazing objects lost to history. The first chamber was filled with an array of what Brown described as primitive mining machinery, as well as a cache of gold treasures and similar artifacts. One of the artifacts, Brown noted, was a metallic spear that possessed unusual properties. Apparently this spear was malleable, but it would always return to its original shape, as if it possessed some kind of memory. One of the next chambers Brown discovered was a room that he thought was likely used for worship purposes, and he said it had a constant faint glow, despite no sources of light being visible. In a nearby chamber, Brown stumbled upon 27 giant skeletons laid against the wall at an angle. These skeletons, according to Brown, varied in height from 6 to 10 feet. 
Near these giants, in an adjacent chamber, Brown said he found two bodies, one man and one woman, who were dressed in what he described as royal robes. After leaving this tunnel, Brown reburied the entrance and was said to have revisited this site periodically throughout the remainder of his life. Brown himself thought that this chamber he discovered was evidence of an ancient, lost civilization of giants that used to inhabit the region we now call California, which incidentally matches up with some of the folklore surrounding the Mount Shasta region. Not much else is known about the rest of Brown's life, other than the fact that he eventually disappeared under strange circumstances, never to be seen again. The sheer amount of paranormal sightings of all kinds reported around Mount Shasta is staggering, and the bizarre nature of the mysteries and legends surrounding Mount Shasta is also quite fascinating. Well, that's all I've got for today's video. Please like the video and leave a comment if you enjoyed it, and feel free to subscribe to my channel for more weekly content. I've got a long list of ideas for future videos, but if there's anything you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comment section. Anyway, thanks for watching.